when 21-year-old Andrew Chambers saw the second plane hit the Twin Towers live on TV, he knew he was going to join the United States Armed Forces. He served two tours, volunteering for the second one after fearing they would choose a soldier with a family to look after. And on that second tour, he lost seven of his best friends. It was only months after he returned when he realized something was wrong. He found himself turning to alcohol every day, reliving memories in his head, constantly feeling on edge, unpredictable, dangerous. His mental health clinic will never forget his voice, pleading, I don't want to hurt someone, but I'm scared I'm going to. His fears proved true. An argument at a bar led to a stranger pulling out a knife and chambers snapped. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Andrew Chambers had post-traumatic stress disorder, but his story is not unique. In the last decade, occurrence of mental health disorders among soldiers has increased. Today alone, 20 veterans will choose to take their lives. These brave men and women have been fighting for the peace of the land and in turn have forfeited their peace within. Why is this happening and what can we do to help? The battlefield is a grim, gruesome, hopeless place. In order to survive, soldiers must be ready to kill. The military is described as training soldiers to harness a rage deep within their psyche, a rage they may not have even known existed. Rage towards the enemy, rage towards their pain, and rage towards the death that surrounds them. Soldiers are also psychologically desensitized to the people they are killing. After all, it's a lot easier to pull the trigger when the one on the other end isn't a husband, a father, a son, but just another cardboard cutout like the dozens you've shot at before. The army teaches you to do now, worry later, contributing to a flood of pent-up emotion the soldiers are made to suffer on their return. Make no mistake, soldiers do not become bloodthirsty animals, but can find it difficult to come to terms with the emotions, the intensity of their grief, their frustration at the tragedy of war, and in some cases, they are left to express these emotions through the rage to which they have been trained to give in. However, there's another aspect of the soldier's training which has an impact, and that is the soldier's image. Soldiers are instructed that they are hardened, toughened, fearless warriors who do not flinch and show no weakness. Tell me, would a fearless warrior admit to feeling depressed, feeling stressed, feeling scared? Unsurprisingly, of the veterans that returned from Afghanistan with mental illness, only a half of them sought help. The stigma surrounding mental illness is a challenge being increasingly exposed to us and is a fight we are fighting to some extent in every profession. But surely it's our veterans experiencing normal human responses to horrors no human would normally see that we should encourage to talk about their feelings. Yet the soldiers may return home only to realize that they were happier back on the battlefield. On the battlefield, bullets fly past inches from your face and you are excruciatingly aware that your life is in the hands of those around you. It is not how do I survive, but how do I make sure the man next to me does not die. From this raw adrenaline-fueled survival on the very brink of death builds an intense camaraderie, a friendship that transcends friendship. Then the soldiers return to our society, our broken, disjointed, fragmented society, in many ways tearing itself apart. Is this the country I was fighting for? Ex-service personnel are so vulnerable to social exclusion and homelessness, and this isolation only exacerbates their mental illness. It is common to see war as binary, a win or a loss. This is not true. Because even behind the barrel of the gun, war is always a tragedy. But as we march on, striving to reduce conflict and replace it with diplomacy, we must ensure we achieve peace off the battlefield as well as on. Today, Andrew Chambers is home and safe in Ohio. He mostly spends his days coaching softball, listening to a bit of country music, and thinking of the family he hopes to start one day. He's been taking his story to the stage as well as in front of the camera, encouraging people everywhere to reach out to the veterans in their community and listen to their stories. Because above all, we have to learn from them.
We have to build a society in which people can rely on each other. A society where cooperation is paramount and isolation unheard of. A society where no man is left behind. So when that final bullet is fired, our soldiers know that it is truly over. Thank you very much. Thank you for your speech. I thought it was really interesting and harrowing what you said about soldiers. Do you think that you could expand this or not expand this to terrorists coming back from war? Yes, we see that, um, well, a popular argument actually put forward by many of the um, soldiers working currently in the United States Armed Forces is that you do not tend to see such levels of um, mental illness amongst terrorist groups because of the, the tight-knit community that they come from. Everyone knows of the cause that they're fighting for. Everyone knows, why, everyone knows what they're doing, and everyone expects to uh, respect the people who are going to do it. Comparing that with the society we live in, it's not quite the same. There's a sort of disengagement with the soldier's cause and the, and the soldier's reasons for going to war. So when the soldiers return to our society, they don't feel, quite, they don't feel like they quite fit in. So yes, you could, you could argue that it happens in both places, but in some ways, that's something that they're doing that we're not doing. I'm not saying that we should enlist everyone to join the armed forces, but it's important to know why our soldiers are making the sacrifices that they're making, and that's the only way they'll feel like they really fit in when they return to our society. Um, nearly 100 years ago, Wilfred Owen wrote uh, a poem which he finished with the lines, um, you know, that old great lie, Dolce de Cormes Propatria Mori. That is to say, we must do away with this great lie that it is right and proper to die for one's country. The problem of soldiers having symptoms like PTSD, even though we didn't identify it as such, has been known about for 100 years, maybe even longer. Why do you think we have not, it is taken until now for us to really be getting to grips with this problem? And what new ideas can you bring that have not been brought thus far? The idea that soldiers can sustain injuries from trauma that doesn't seem to have any external marks is something that is new and we are coming to grips with at the moment. Actually, as, um, as war changes and war technology becomes um, even more advanced and we have stronger armor, we're going to be seeing more people returning from the battlefield. And while that is excellent, we have to be prepared to deal with it. Current uh, systems that are used to screen for mental illness include um, tick box forms that soldiers are given and they will fill out as to feeling whether they're whether they feel uh, scared or whether they feel stressed on their last, their last um, mission outside the camp. There are arguments for and against this. Some people feel that because the sol they need to reach so many soldiers at once, it's very easy to um, give out these forms and let everyone fill them in. But there are people who believe that these sort of impersonal methods do not, uh, well, these impersonal methods make it easier for soldiers to hide behind that stigma, behind that fear of being thought of as weak or being belittled, or worse, being taken out of uh, out of the tour. So uh, I would suggest more personal methods of talking to these soldiers and discussing, discussing their emotions. Not necessarily for those that are suffering, but getting that, uh, that culture of talking about your emotions and realizing that it is OK to feel these things that you're feeling. I'm sure you know about the situation of Bo Bergdahl, who was a soldier who um, supposedly abandoned his post and went into the Taliban territory and was captured for five years and returned to the States. Um, and then was vilified because abandoning the army was seen as kind of the worst thing he could have done. And we don't know what really happened. But I suppose what I'm wondering is, how do we stop treating soldiers as one homogenous group? Um, they're either all affected, they're not affected. We think of them largely as male when in fact there are female officers and so on and so on. So how do we kind of distinguish between veterans and treat them as people and not just as a system that churns them out? Because I think, for me, that's part of the problem. Perhaps what you've just mentioned is an excellent argument for using more personal methods than the impersonal methods that we've used before. Talking to them and treating each one as an individual, not just perhaps their unit number or just which number of soldiers they are in that, in that force. Talking to them and realizing that each person is different. Each person's reaction to the horrors they're seeing are different. Each, each horror that each person faces, will, every story is unique. And we don't know how people are going to react to their stories. Especially when they're things that they, when, when they leave for the war, they have the idea that 
they're ready to give that sacrifice for their country. But these decisions that are being made and what, what, where they're going to fight, what they're actually going to have to do, they don't know. It's, their, it's out of their control. It reminds me, actually, of um, Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, Charge of the Light Brigade, which says, uh, there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die. They've got to give that sacrifice to their country. And I think that is deserving of the respect that we should give them, treating them as each individual person and then evaluating their responses uniquely. <laughs>